Please go to our webpage, libertyhouseusa.org. Once again, libertyhouseusa.org. Or go to our YouTube channel. You can treat us also the videos that we have there to enrich your spiritual life. Hallelujah. Okay, so we thank God. We are still in the year of our Lord, 2022. We are in the month of July. And we bless God for what He's doing through us and with us, touching lives. Uh, all over the place, wherever you find yourself. I am a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ, an agent of change and transformation, with a message from the Lord to you. And uh, my intent is not to be um, condescending, it's not to degrade you in any way. So if I say anything that does not resonate with you, please don't pick up the fight with me. Just know that we are on the same team. And for you and not against you. Hallelujah. All right. So um, I'm handling um, a subject I, I started last week. It's quite sensitive, but I will still have to do it. Um, and I, I, I want to read. I want to read from Galatians to set Galatians chapter four. Let's go to the verse 23, if I'm not mistaken. Hallelujah. I was going to say whatever I was going to say, but I think reading it, uh, something in the Word will give uh, them a different kind of uh, understanding. So let's do it. I'll attend to that place now. Okay, Galatians, Galatians 4, 23. So let's read. Um, no, let's take it from for understanding sake, context. All right. Let's take it from 21, please. Let's take it from 21. Okay. So we are reading from the New King James uh, Version of the Bible. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear? The law. Those who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Uh, let's continue. Verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, 
The one by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. We know the two sons, right? What are the names of the two sons? Ishmael and uh, Isaac. Okay, let's read on. 23. But he who was born, I'm sorry, but he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh. Flesh meaning natural. Okay? And that, that same word is uh, the skin of uh, an animal or uh, what do you call it? A human being. It also means a human being because Jesus, the word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And at times the same flesh can mean uh, what do you call it? The ways of the self. The unregenerated kind of or the unborn, the one who is not born again, the way they act. The same word flesh at times can relate to the law. Alright, so it's you have to interpret these things very well when you're reading the Bible. Okay, and he of the free woman through promise. So one Ishmael, one Isaac. One from the bond woman, the name was Hagar, and then the one from the free woman, Sarah. Okay, let's continue to read. No, let me let me let me bring this out before I go there. You see what we read here? Let's have the new living translation. It says born according to the flesh. Now, it's telling us what it means to be born according to the flesh. So, the son of the slave wife was born in what? A human attempt or a human effort to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the free born wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. So what I'm going to talk about, let me say this so I don't have to go that far. Whether we like it or not, at every given time we are engaged in some kind of work, labor, toil, or works. So I will use that interchangeably, work or works. Whether one is believing God or whether one is working in unbelief, we are still engaged in some works. I want to get that out there. I'll say that again. Whether you are working in unbelief or you are believing God, that means you have faith in God and you are doing what He says to you, both sides of the coin, there are works involved. One side of the coin, the works are accepted by God, the other side, they are not because they are human efforts, human attempt to bring to pass or to realize or experience what should be experienced by what? Faith. When Jesus died, when he was raised, when uh, he ascended, he was seated on the right hand side of God, a new way of living was released to us. It changed from the law to that new way of living. And that is the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So let's not forget that. And when I when I, I read that, probably you have to go there. So this is by what? Human attempt or human effort. And when you read down, you are going to realize that it's by human what? Effort. But let's pause and go to uh, Hebrews 11, uh, six. Then we'll come back to this uh, Galatians four twenty three. Hebrews eleven six. Let's read together. Read, and it is impossible to please God without what faith. It doesn't say um, if you try hard, you can please God without faith. It's impossible. Impossible means impossible. It cannot be. It means that there's just a, pre a prescribed way to please God. Without that prescribed way, 
without that, um, what do you call it? Uh, how should I put it? Prescribe another thing is what? Establish way. There's no any other way. Okay, so let's get that clear. It is impossible to please God without faith. We are reading from the New Living Translation. Anyone who wants to come to Him, God, must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely what seek Him. Okay, so now let's go back to what we're reading. Now here, you see King James. Let's have King James Version for those who are skeptical. New King James Version. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please Him, to please God. That's it. Without faith, it is impossible. It means, also, God rewards faith. I heard something, and it, it troubles me anytime I hear that, and people are saying that. You know, they keep saying that the only thing that moves God is prayer. It's wrong. It's wrong. The only thing, I tell somebody to say it this way, the only thing that moves the hand of God, they won't say the only thing that moves God, but they will say the only thing that moves the hand of God is prayer. It's wrong. You see, when we come up by saying things that the Bible has not said, or the Lord Jesus Christ has not endorsed, then we go into human effort or human attempt. And a lot of that is going on. That is why we have so many people who are not fulfilled in their faith. They can tell you they've been tithing for years. They've been giving offerings for years. They've been going to meetings after meetings. They have fasted. They have prayed. They've done everything and yet so the same. Now I want to bring something up. At times I hear some people when they teach, when they preach, they keep saying everything is by prayer. Everything is by prayer. And they have to pray. And we have to pray. And it takes prayer to do this. And they will show you from the, what, the beginning of the, the beginning chapter of Luke. How Jesus prayed in every chapter. They'll take you to ask of the apostles how in every chapter there was prayer. But what they fail to do is they don't teach the people how to pray. Because if he said, it's by prayer, it's by prayer. What kind of prayer? How do I pray? You know, but when you look through the Bible, there's a way that these people that receive answers from God, there's a way they pray. So unless we are taught how to do this kind of prayer, we we'll just go before God in the name of praying, and we'll pray, and it will be human effort or human attempt. We won't get results because it's not done by faith. So back to my statement. You see, it's God is not moved by what? Prayer. He's moved by faith in his word. Our confidence in his word. When you have confidence in his word, you have confidence in him. And when we talk about our, our prayer, you cannot pray without faith. If you stand before God, to go even before God, like we are saying now, if you're going there, going to him, you must believe that he is. And what does it take? Faith. It doesn't say it takes prayer. When Paul said, Come boldly to the throne of grace, he didn't say, Come with prayer. He says, uh, that's uh, Hebrews 4, 16. Come boldly. Come with assurance. Come with confidence to the throne of grace. Why? Knowing that you're already accepted in the beloved. You're already cleansed. You already have a right standing before God, your Father. You are welcome at any time. All right. What does it take to go before God? Paul didn't say you have to come, pray, Let's say early in the morning, pray in terms of 15 minutes or an hour before you come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm saying these things because these are some of the things that we have gone into as the body of Christ and we are into our own human effort. He doesn't say that. He only says, come. Come. Hallelujah. Come boldly. Boldly to the throne of grace. He's telling you, you have to come. Not by prayer. You come, not by what? Fasting. You come, not by offering. Because some people call this, oh, uh, you shall not come. No wonder then they say it in James way. Thou shall not come before the Lord empty. Yeah. You see, so to them, that means offering. But that was in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ had not offered his whole life. 
When he has offered himself, his own life, he's not requiring any offer from you again. The only thing he desires from you is says, you have to know that I own you because I redeem you, I ransom you. I brought you back from the enemy. So it says, present your bodies as well, a living sacrifice. It's your rational service. That's what the Bible says. Your whole being belongs to him. And that's what he wants. Present that to him without reservation. That is one work or one of the works that God wants us to do. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord is one of the works a Christian must daily want engage in or do. In the Old Testament, presenting offerings to the Lord most of the time for sin it was a dead animal. It was killed, slaughtered before. Had no control. You hit it with the bat, won't feel it. But here, he wants us still to feel things because we are in this world. Alright? We represent him. He wants us, giving us what? Free will to be able to choose him over what? Anybody else. To choose his word over anybody's philosophy, ideology, or anybody's opinion. Your own, including your own opinion. He's giving us a free will. The way he leads us is not by control, it's not by force, it's by love. So you realize that even though we say God is suffering, he doesn't force anybody to drive them to church service. He doesn't drive anybody or will take money from your uh, bank accounts for his work. He's not going to force you to give to somebody or he's not going to force you to do something for somebody. He doesn't do that. All right? He will just tag on, the, on your heart, prompt you, speak to you through his word. And then he, he allows you, he gives you room, he gives you space, he gives you distance just to take his word. And it's, it doesn't force you. Hallelujah. So when we do, we do the presentation of our bodies, which the Bible calls our reasonable service, rational service, is one of the works we have to do. That one is acceptable before God. Did he say, <laughs> I'm going ahead of myself, too many things now. He didn't say we should fast, so we present our bodies. Let's go there. Let's go to the Romans chapter. Uh, 12 verse 1. These things are in the word, but they are twisted and they are misinterpreted. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable word, service. Now, we have added fasting to it. We have added prayer to it. See, so people think that so far as I prayed this morning, I prayed, uh, I prayed before I went to bed, I presented myself to the Lord. But what does it mean to present yourself to the Lord? Do you hear me? How do we present it? Now, for us not to be in the, should I say, um, in the dark, he tells us how to do it. Verse 2 is simple. That is it. Verse 2 tells us. Can we read verse 2? Oh, okay, let, okay, let's read that. And then we'll go back and read uh, a different translation. Alright? So we get it. Okay, verse 2. So we all read that. We are in Romans chapter 12. We are reading verse 2 now. Hallelujah. Read. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god this is work this work that god wants us to engage ourselves with work that he wants us to do on daily basis this work do you get it this is work Making sure that even though you are in this world and you have uh, things around you, you have to understand that the system of the world is not God's system. The order of the world 
the way people go about even governing and uh, running businesses and doing things, not everything is contingent on the principles of God. Some, they are off. That is why some people work in some places when they are hired and they realize what is going on, they say, no, 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 this is contrary to my values or my belief system, and they quit. Because they realize that what goes on in there is not okay. All right? So you have to understand that. So it says that don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Meaning that where you are uh, intellectually uh, is not where you are supposed to be. You are not there yet. So you hear the word and you change the way you think. You hear the word, you change what you believe. Do you get it? You hear the word, you change what you believe. To so come in, in line with what the word of God is saying. And the Bible says that with that, you will prove. Meaning that you will experience what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect in the sight of God. Hallelujah. But let's look at this word and present. Verse 1. Hallelujah. The word presents. Verse 1. So is to stand beside. That is, exhibit. It's talking about to place beside or near. To set a hand. To what is this? Uh, to provide. To place a person or thing at one's disposal. To present a person for, an for another to see and question. To present or show. To bring to. Bring near. Hallelujah. To bring into one's fellowship or intimacy. I think I like that. To stand beside, to stand by or near. To be at hand. You see, this is the definition of the word present that is used there. And so we have to do it daily. Look, if we look at the life of uh, the apostles, one is like uh, Peter. Peter, de despite the fact that he was with Jesus, was following, at certain times he wasn't. Okay, so I'm giving you that example for you to understand. When he said, everybody is going to deny you, but I will follow you if it means dying for you, I'll do that. But what happened? When he saw how Jesus was being treated, he said, what? I value my life. I'm not going to die for this guy. I'm not going to suffer for this guy. And what did he do? Instead of denying himself, he denied the Lord. Okay, so he went into what? Human effort. All right? He saw works, not the works of God. Because the work of God then was for him to deny himself. So he would face whatever the consequence would be at that time. But no. All right? Then when the Lord uh, even was raised, what happened? He said, I'm going back to fishing. He was taken from fishing, you know, to walk in the things of God, the work of God. Then he said, no, no, I'm going back to my human work, my own effort. I'm going back to what? Fishing. And he took the rest of the disciples. So that is what? Not presenting himself. Then along the line, he repented. He worked. He bounced back. This guy now was different. So now he was into the works of God or the very work that God wanted him to be in. So here we can talk about you see, you can talk about there's righteousness apart from the works of the law. And then there's righteousness by works of faith. So that's what we are looking at. To go by the righteousness that comes from the law, what is acceptable before God by the law, you have to then do the things under the law. But this one, it wasn't like that. Okay. Wow, that was a long route. Okay, now let's go back to what we're reading. When uh, Galatians chapter 4. Because I say things that are a bit controversial or not popular, I always have to back it up. For somebody to know, to know that it's in a way. So here it says, uh, the son, when um, Galatians 4.23, the son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. 
But the one of the freeborn life was born as God's uh, own fulfillment of the promise, of his promise. Now, we know the story in Genesis chapter 16, when Sarah said to Abraham, no, it's like, I'm not having any kind of uh, luck with this. Nothing is coming up, so why don't you try the maid, Hagar? So Abraham listened, and that's what happened. And so after that, God, God said, no, 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 no. When I made the promise, I wasn't referring to uh, Hagar, your maid. I was talking about your wife, Sarah. So Sarah still is going to bring forth a child. Bible says, Abraham believed that. He believed it. Amen. The first time, he believed. But he was stubborn here and there. And that's what happens to all of us. God speaks to us, and uh, we latch on it. It's like, okay, that's it. We get excited about it. We are moving forward. But then we have somehow a time frame in our mind. And when it doesn't happen, then we become somehow disappointed. It's like our hope is dashed. All right? And then if we don't do something about it, the enemy catalyzes on that. He can say all kinds of negative things to you about God. Why you shouldn't trust him? How is not going to, this is not going to work? You are even uh, what, on the wrong path. You go through the hearing. You know what I believe in is this. Is that all kinds of things. But you have to know that God has his time. And with Abraham, at the right time, it happened for him. Now let's continue the reading. Let's go back to King James. That will make it easier. And then I think verse 29, we'll go back to uh, the other translation. But he who was of the bad woman was born according to what? The flesh. And uh, he of the bond, oh, the same place. Okay, so let's jump to verse 24. Are you comfortable with the AC? Okay. Which things, we are talking about these two, which things are symbolic? For these are the two uh, covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage. The law gives birth to bondage. That's what it is. Which is Hagar. Okay, next verse. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children because they have not accepted the Messiah. The Bible says in John chapter 1, 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. 12 says, but as many as received him, gave him the right to be called the children or sons of God. So that's why he's saying bondage because they still believe in the Mosaic, the law. They were under that. Okay, let's read on. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the matter of us all. So it's referring to Jerusalem that's from above. Jesus came from above. All right? So it's talking about what? Living by faith and not under the law. Let's continue. The covenant cut by Jesus. For it is written, rejoice all. We can, we, we can skip this and go to 28. To save time. 28. Galatians 4. Now, I like the way it says now. Okay, now we, referring to anybody that is born again, brethren, are Isaac, as, I'm sorry, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Do you get it? So how come he's not saying as Ishmael was? But it says as Isaac was. Isaac was promised to uh, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And God made sure he didn't give the name. Wow, that's serious. He gave the name of the child. Okay, let's read on. We are children of promise. And uh, along the line, probably when I touch on it, you understand why I'm reading that. We are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. You know what he's talking about? You know what really happened? And that is why Sarah, Sarah said, no, no, let's keep these people out. And he greeted uh, Abraham in Genesis 21. But the Lord said to Abraham, listen to your wife. Hallelujah. 
and they had to go. So persecution happened. What is this? What does this mean? What does this mean? Let's read it in the uh, New Living Translation. Let's read together. Read. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human what? effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. And that is what goes on in the church. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about the church versus the unchurch, the born again versus not born again. I'm talking about within the church, amongst uh, ministers of the gospel, this confusion is going on. Some still are holding on to the law. They claim, okay, Jesus died for our salvation to make us right, but you know, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, so is the word of God and must be obeyed. And I always say that not every word that is written in the word of God must be obeyed. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews, Jesus, Hebrews 13, uh, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Doesn't he say Moses the same yesterday, today, and forever? And it's not Moses who died for us, the whole world. It is Jesus who died for the whole world. Now, the law, that's why last time I titled the message, The Dominion of the Mosaic Law. Look, the law is powerful. If you underrate it, you will stay in bondage or you live in bondage for the rest of your life. See where Paul was, who was then called Saul. Look at how, with passion, he persecuted the church to the point of eliminating some of them. It took revelation, not changing. And when you see people under the law, they are very legalistic. Look, they, they, their zeal is so much. You do watch it. Those who practice the law, the way they are, they are good stewards, good custodians of the heresy, the deceit, the deception, the law that they are practicing. You watch them. They are very rigid about it, committed. At times, they, they don't even want to listen to you. Even though you are all talking about the same Bible, they don't even want to listen to you. Paul was like that. But he changed when he had revelation and he stopped pursuing the law, obeying the law. And he started living by faith. Two thirds of the New Testament now we read. He got it by revelation. He wrote it. So we can learn something from him. Hallelujah. He says something like this concerning the law, blameless. Wow. And yet he changed by way of revelation. So this is going to be going on. Some portion of the church, until they come into revelation, they think they are serving God, so they will do it. And that's why I talk about things. <sighs> Let me go here and read. And when I read this, probably we'll, we'll get it. Hallelujah. So let's go to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. What I was talking to you that happened in, uh, what's the name? Genesis is written in the well, where we're reading, but I'm saving time. Romans chapter 7. Now, why was I saying all what, what I was saying? 6. But now we we have been delivered from the law. law. We have been delivered from the law. We've been discharged from the law. We've been disconnected, as it were, from the law. Hallelujah. And last time I was able to read uh, some of the things that it talks about. So it's like something that is passed away. Um, to terminate all intercourse with one, to be severed from, separated from, discharged from, loosed from. That's what is happening. We are loose from the law. Now, why is this important? What I'm saying, we are delivered. We are delivered. We are delivered. We are delivered from the law. What am I stressing that? Under the law, there were a lot of things. Okay? And just like when something, okay, when something is changed, like in a country, something is changed, it takes some time for people to adjust to the change. And in the same way, 
The Israelites, you can imagine, they've practiced this for centuries. They've lived that way for centuries before Jesus showed up. But what is so fascinating and very assuring is the fact that they prophesied, prophets prophesied about this change. Under the law, they prophesied how Jesus, the Messiah, would show up, how he would die, how with that he's going to bring about a new way of living, he's going to restore the kingdom and stuff like that, and all the nayas. How he was going to be born, where he was going to be born, what he was going to do, the whole nayas. And yet, when it happened, they miss it. You see, because you can look at things from a human standpoint, instead of looking at things the way God wants us to look at it. So they miss it. If we are delivered from the law, it means that anything that is under the law too, we are delivered from it. Now, so I'm going to dip, uh, drop one of these things. I know when I say people argue a lot about that. Do you know that when God called Abraham, there was nothing like even prayer in the picture? Somebody said, this guy doesn't believe in prayer. No, 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 don't go there. <laughs> I believe in prayer, all right. I'm talking about the right way of praying. Because Abraham was an idolater, so whatever he was praying, well, he wasn't praying to God. And God didn't wait until Abraham uh, learned how to pray to him, God, before he called him. Do you know what I'm saying? He called him by his own mercy, by his own love, by his own goodness. He called Abraham. That was it. That's it. Then it was after he had called him that the relationship began and then God started teaching him then he learned how to be in fellowship or communication with God. Do you get the picture? Now, I'm going to drop another thing. That time, Abraham wasn't fasting. I want you to get it. Because fasting was introduced under the law. <laughs> fasting was introduced under the law. The day of atonement, they had to fast. Now, that is how when Jesus showed up, the Pharisees harassed him. How come the disciples don't fast? That's what they are used to. The people take on that statement, oh, how can they fast when uh, the, uh, what they, are, they are with their friend or the bridegroom? When the bridegroom is away, then they will fast. But what we have to think is this. If that is a requirement, the Bible will say that without fasting, no one can please God. Without fasting, you cannot become born again, or you cannot become a child of God. Without fasting, you cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Without fasting, your prayer will not be answered. Without fasting, God will not be pleased with you. But as doesn't say that. In the same way, we can talk about prayer. I'm trying to show how we're taking things and we have a we have a now an exaggerated opinion about these things, belief about these things. And we are now worshipping these things instead of uh, what believing in the word of God. I've listened to preachers over and over and over and over. Yesterday I heard one. And it was the same thing. Look, this guy talked the same thing about prayer and fasting kind of a conference. They are doing 31 days fast. And this guy who was talking about fast and prayer, fasting and prayer, and all that he was telling them, he would pick uh, how, and uh, for instance, in uh, Luke chapter 1, he served God in fastings and prayers day and night. He would talk about that. Then he would pick another thing. How before Jesus picked his disciples, he went to prayer. Then he would pick another chapter and talk about how this happened. But before it happened, you know, there was prayer. And then just go and go and go and go and go. The guy never once touched on the word of God to say that the Bible says this. And he had to believe what he says. Jesus died for you, and he had to believe that. And Jesus, when he died, as a result, if you believe in him, you have power, you have authority over the devil, you become the son of God, and you can come to him, you can do this, and by him you can cast out devils or whatever. Nothing. And what I realized, and I think if it's not ignorance, then it's intentional. You see, because the person, all that he said was putting emphasis on himself, like he has power. I mean, and then he did it. He said, okay. He said, okay, I'm going to pray now. 
and there are uh, like 11 people, you mentioned the number, like 11 people here now, then they, uh, they, they will receive the gift of prophecy. Are you listening to me carefully? They will receive the gift of prophecy. Then there are some here that uh, they are going to have dreams. They will be dream, they will be dreaming. Then there are some here that uh, they are going to be blessed, so that they are going to have business. Like they have mentioned a number, like five people or whatever. You know, like if they are born again, you are addressing people who are born again. They believe in God and they are fasting, even though they are doing it wrongly. Tell them that if you are born again. You have the Holy Spirit in you. And if the Holy Spirit indwells you, then you have all the, these gifts of the Spirit. Am I wrong about it? You have all the gifts of the Spirit because the Bible says to one is given the gift of this by the same Spirit. According to 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 12. To another is given the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, the gift of faith by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles by the same Spirit. To another, prophecy, discerning of what? Spirit, so another gifts of healing by the same spirit. So, if the same spirit who is the Holy Spirit in God's you now, you stand before people and you are giving them the impression that now you are going to pray for them and these gifts are going to come upon them or going to come into their lives. If this is not error, what is it? Deception, what is it? Ignorance in demonstration, I don't know, but you see, I don't expect to see some of these things, because some of them, they've been in ministry for years. So I wonder if they do that to keep the people. You know, to the point that they say things like that. Now that you are doing this fasting, your marriage is going to be better. Your marriage is going to work. You see, it doesn't take fasting for marriage to work. You get what I'm saying? From the beginning, the Father didn't say, God didn't say, by prayer and fasting, a man shall leave his what? Parents and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He didn't say that. He doesn't take prayer and fasting. <laughs> Cleaving, you have to have understanding what to do. It takes harmony. It takes unity. It takes peace. So you have to know what things to do to maintain peace. Like uh, Ephesians 4, 3, talks about the fact that endeavor to what? Keep the unity of the spirit, the bond of what? Peace. You have to know how to do it. Let's have it there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Endeavoring to what? Keep the unity of the spirit. There's already unity. Okay, so let, let me break this down for you to understand. By virtue that we are children of God, we have come into some unity that is solid. Therefore, if a Christian marries a fellow Christian, you're already in harmony. All right? There's no sweat. But now, because you're all work in progress, you have to know how to disagree, to agree, or to find the common ground when you have disagreements. That's it. When you have issues, how you use the same word of God. No prayer, no fasting. But you take the same principles of the word of God, what it says when you have something against somebody. When you disagree with somebody. You know, what do you do? Jesus said it in Matthew 18. He says, if you have something against your brother, go to him. So it's about sitting down. It says, let no corrupt uh, communication proceed from your mouth. That is Ephesians 4.29. Uh, and then he says what? Uh, let him minister uh, grace to the uh, let him minister grace to the hearer, you know, so they will be edified. So these things you know, love doesn't harm. So when you know these things, you practice them. You don't have to miss your meal. You understand what I'm saying? The time that you're going to use to be praying, Father, oh Father, 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 Abba, Father, Jehovah, Jehovah. You can you can sit before your spouse and looking at uh, you know your spouse and be smiling and say how oh, I love you. I'm so happy I'm married to you. You know what I'm saying? But no, see some people do all these things. The very spouse they want to have harmony with, they will abuse that spouse. Then they'll go and hide the next minute. Pray. That's it, make sense? They'll go and hide and pray. And then the moment they come out of prayer. Then, you know, instead of being nice, sitting to this person that they were praying about, oh, come and see. 
What is that? It doesn't take prayer. It doesn't take fasting. You have to know what you have to do. And they've been selling this for years. And, you know, it's a pity. When you see how people have got it, and they are, they are taking in everything that is being said without weighing it. And uh, no wonder some have been Christians for years. They are still struggling. Human effort. That's what I call it. Human effort. Human attempt. You are in your own works. And it doesn't work. It's not going to happen. <laughs> One of the years, I was somewhere, and uh, somebody came to me and said, Oh, I've been going to this particular uh, store to get something. I, I drove by, drove by, drove by. The store was closed. Then he said, oh, one of these, he bumped into this person. He said, oh, I've been coming by your store to buy my stuff. And I uh, realized the store was closed. He said, oh, it's, it's not closed. I only shut it for a moment. I had to go and pray. You see what is going on? All the time you shut your, uh, whatever, <laughs> job, you go and pray. You are not doing sales. You are not selling. And then you go and blame God that, oh, people are not buying from you. Your business is not going good. You know, because you fail to do what you have to do. This is it. Let's have a uh, New Living Translation. Ephesians 4, 3. Uh, make every effort to do what? To keep yourselves what? Well. United in the spirit. How? Binding yourself together with peace. Peace is also uh, translated as harmony. Peace. So this one, you know, <laughs> when you're angry, what do you do? Bible tells you. It says, you have right. You can be angry. Something can get you, you know, whatever. But it says, do not sin. Do not have to fast about this. Do not have to pray for this. I mean, this happened. I'm telling you, Resta. One wedding start for many, many years ago. This lady came to me and she had issues. And uh, somebody had offended her. And I said, you know, you know what the Bible says. You have to just forgive the person. He said, Pastor, you, have, uh, you don't understand. What this person did to me, unless, unless I fast. I'm not, it's like, I'm not going to forgive her unless I fast. Bible doesn't say fast before you forgive. Am I right? Forgive, you choose to forgive. It's an act of your will. This is how we are making things complicated. So complex. We don't like the simple things. The simple way Jesus paid it all. So we are just to believe it and just do it. We make things complicated. <laughs> Let's have uh, Amplify. And can you read? I know that it's going to be time. It says what? Be eager. Let's try earnestly. First, it says make every effort. You know that most of the time people don't do that. They don't make every effort. You have to exhaust uh, every possible one. I mean, but people don't do that. Make every effort. So here it says be eager and strive earnestly toward God and keep the harmony and what oneness of and produced by the spirit in the binding power of peace this already you brought into unity you brought into peace you brought into harmony continue to work in it easy and this is one of the things that i have come to realize like this guy kept preaching how can you pray right if you don't even know the word? And uh, he used my favorite, you know, kind of verse, uh, Luke six twelve. Jesus, he said, Jesus went to a solitary pray place and he prayed all night. He said, if Jesus himself prayed all night, you know, what are you doing? It's like so you two have to pray all night. But at times they don't understand that he labored in a way, so we don't have to labor the same way. He paid the way. So the amount, the money he paid for the ransom to construct the path to fulfillment, to what? Productivity. We don't have to pay a construction company to have a path like that, what? 
constructed for us. He constructed it with his life, so we'll just walk in it because he loves us. Simple. And we are trying to, what is this? He said here, uh, reinvent the wheel. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why? Let's go back to the Romans 7 6. I've always been believing God for how to express some of these things because. It's oh this one no New King James please yeah but now we have been delivered from the law having what died to what we were held by the law holds you back so that we should what serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter hallelujah you know what Bible says we are. We are redeemed from the law. You know why? Because the, uh, the, uh, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Because the curse of the law is a result of disobedience to the law. So if we've been delivered from the law itself, the anything, consequence, that comes from disobedience to the law, we are also free from that. We are delivered. We are severed. We are discharged, disconnected from the law. We are under a new law. Hallelujah. So let's look at uh, um, what is it? Galatians 3 13. It says, We are redeemed from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Do you have that? Christ has redeemed us. It's not like he's going to. And the word redeem is powerful. And we always have to acknowledge that. He brought us back. Hallelujah. He brought us back. When he brought us or ransomed us, it's not that somebody was in control of our lives. The word you say, that's what it means. It's not just paying a price. But it's buying you back from somebody who had control over you. So that's what happened. From Satan, from the law, and what have you, he brought us back. Having what? Become a curse for us. For this little case, everyone who hangs on the tree. He took us from a place of a what? Curse to a place where we are working in abundance, where we are blessed. 14 says that, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. Hallelujah. Okay, and when some people preach, they don't talk about this. They only talk about curse, 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 curse. Now, have you realized that generational curse is common in the church? They talk so much about generational curse. You don't hear so much about the blessing of Abraham that we have. We have received. Unless, let's say, offering time. You know the song that I'm going to sing? You know what? Often time there's one song that you can only tell about it. Abraham, Abraham's blessing. Abraham's blessings are mine. Is that what you say? Abraham's blessings are mine. That's the only time. Only a few people teach about it. You hear everything that goes on wrong in your life. They say, hmm, have you been to deliverance before? Generational care. Then they begin to trace. Okay, like when you go to the hospital, they do at times. Oh, is there anybody in your family with this disease? This is this is blah 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 blah. And this is what I want to say. If genetically, by way of hereditary, something can be in the uh, what do you call what's, what how should I say? A natural family line or blood. How much more? The spiritual line of blood. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. And that's what he he redeemed us. The way it works naturally is the same. He laid down his life so we'll be redeemed from this natural, negative, suffering, broke, lack, sickness, disease, death, everything negative you can think about. Judgment, condemnation, the whole ask to redeem us from that. Amen. 
So we we'll never come on that. So he said, oh, I'm married because of that. Oh, in our, in our, in our what? family, people can relate. Oh, in our family, they bring forth late. Uh, in our family, you know, people bring, have children, but they are not married. And it's, these things are true. I'm not trying to downplay uh, these things. They are true. But you have to ask yourself questions. When did that happen? You have to what you think. So if your belief system, your value system tells you that, then that's what you get. But if you come into knowledge and you work with that knowledge, I'm talking about truth, things change. The word of God is powerful. You see, it says, if you have faith like a master seed, nothing, nothing is going to be all impossible to you. That's what it is. But the subject of faith itself, hmm, is, how should I say, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a warfare kind of subject in the church. Some condemn it. They say, oh, why should we be teaching our faith? We should teach our something else. But when you read uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, it says three things are bad. It mentions uh, what? Faith. It mentions hope. It mentions charity, which is love. It said the greatest of these is love. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, Jesus talked about love. But before he said that, he, he talked about have faith in me. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Amen. Hallelujah. That's how it starts. So we are redeemed from anything that the curse, the curse brings. Let's have the 14th verse. We are redeemed from that. The blessing is stronger than the curse. You get it? Okay. I've not said this way before, but let me say If if it's God who gave the law to the people of Israel through Moses, and it's this same God who is saying that, okay, I gave you the law. This is the consequence of those who break the law, violate the law. But because I realize what is going on, I'm coming up with uh, another thing. So it's going to free all of you people from the violation of the law. So now, this is the way. Do this, and then everything under the law that is due you, no, it's canceled. It's over. Rather, I'm bringing you into blessing. Why do we struggle with that? Why do we struggle with that? Is it not the same God? Why? Because, is it because we like suffering? We like to struggle? We like to be in bondage? But you know, I come to realize that. And that's why I talk so much against the fasting thing. People think they can punish themselves. Oh, 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 let me tell you this. This fasting thing that they were talking about. No, no, some people have fasting in some ways that we don't know, the way they do it. They were talking about eating in the morning, eating in the afternoon, then you skip some meals, then you don't eat, and then throughout the night, then the morning before you eat and whatever. And I was like, oh, wow. So when they talk about fasting, that's how they do it too. <laughs> And I was shocked when I heard that. <laughs> when I heard that, I was shocked. I said, oh, ah, no wonder you guys you do the 40 days and you do the 21 days and whatever, whatever you do. You eat in the morning. You know, even after you eat, then you skip from then. Then you don't eat. Let's say, somebody said the last is like two. Then you don't eat again. You know, until the following day. Then you fast it. Wow. You are punishing yourself. You see, you don't need to fast before God will show you mercy. I don't know how better I can say it. Now, God showing you mercy, God being merciful to you, God helping you is no longer contingent on fasting. In the Old Testament, it was. But now, no. It's all about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, he didn't teach that. That for you to come to the Father. He says you come by me. He didn't say come by fasting. He didn't say come by prayer. You have to have faith in him. You have to have confidence in him. Persuasion, conviction that he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He laid down his life for the whole world. He was indeed raised from the dead. He was indeed ascended. He was indeed seated 
by the right hand of the Father. You have to believe that. He was born by a virgin called Mary. You have to believe all this. He did lead. You got what I'm saying? This thing that at times is so hard, difficult, about living by faith, you shouldn't be hard anymore. I'm going to drop this on you and think about it. We all say we haven't seen God before. But Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Did Jesus really live on this earth? Yes, he did. So people say God is not real. It's over. They can't say that anymore. He became flesh. He dwelt amongst us. I didn't come to meet uh, George Washington, the first president of the United States, if I'm not correcting. Who is the first president of the United States? Is it George Washington? Abraham Lincoln. Uh huh. <laughs> Who is the first president? Hmm? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, who came to meet uh, uh, President uh, George Washington? What about Abraham Lincoln? You did it. But he gave me. Yes. You get what I'm saying? In the same way, Jesus Christ lived on this earth. He's the only person who died and he was raised. He was raised from the tomb. How? By the Holy Spirit. Do you get it? As it was prophesied, as he himself said, it happened. So it's real. You know, but just that we are used to our physical, what do you call it, senses. We've lived that way for years. So we are now in the new kind of a uh, we trying to learn how to do it. Look at Galatians chapter 4. Let, let's read 4 and 5. Then we are done. Galatians. I wish I can. Okay. I read. Let's back up. 4, 4 first. Galatians 4, 4. Let's back up soon. Three says, even so, I'll be giving a signal, so I'm trying to rush. Forgive me. <laughs> so three, we are reading from three Galatians four. Even so, three, three before four. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Verse four now. But when the fullness of the time had come, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent for his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Born under the law. When Jesus was born, the law was still in book. The law was acting. The law was the law at that time. We're not under grace. So a lot of things that he says did, he did under the law to fulfill the law. He became one of us in order to fulfill the law. Okay, let's read on. And then 5, Galatians 4, it says, To redeem those who were one under the law. To redeem. So we are delivered from the law. We are also redeemed from the law. To redeem those who were under what? the law. That we might receive what? the adoption as sons. So the law has no power over me. Hallelujah. Do you get it? The law has no power over me. So like I was telling you, the word that is used to buy up, that is to ransom, to rescue from loss, redeem by payment of a price to recover from the power of another, to ransom, buy off. So Jesus freeing us the elect from the dominion of the Mosaic law at a price of his own death. That's it. That's what he redeemed us from the law. We don't have to live by the law or anything that comes from the law. Anything that came from the law, we don't have to live by. Anything. Any element, no matter how small it is, if it came from the law, we are free from it. 
because we are delivered from the law and we are also redeemed from the law. And we are also what? Redeemed from the curse of the law. Because we are justified apart from the works of the law. We are justified by faith and we continue to live by faith, not by the law. The same element that saved us, the same agency is what we continue to live by. The just shall live by faith. Not by the law. And that, that's it for tonight. Because my time is up. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. And I charge you with the words in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 and 13. Stand firm in the liberty of well with Jesus, the anointed one, has made you free. And do not again entangle yourself with, with bondage. The yoke of money by my love, some one another. Love you guys.